Please welcome the head of driver assistance and chassis system, Professor Dr. Ralf Hertwig. Thank you. A very good evening to all of you. You heard us talk a lot about autonomous driving lately, and you may wonder, why is that? The simple answer is, we think that autonomous driving goes to the very core of our products, and that's what I want to talk about today. See, traditionally, the value proposition of our products is that those motor vehicles are sometimes the only, often the fastest, certainly if it's a Mercedes, the most enjoyable way from one point to another. And with that comes the notion of freedom to move. But you all know that driving is perhaps not always as beautiful as on a coastal highway or an empty mountain road. Sometimes driving looks to many of us like this. It's driving in a traffic jam at slow speeds in dense traffic with long travel times. So we have to wonder what is the future value proposition of our products. We think there is a place for the individual motor vehicle, and we think there is still place and room for freedom, but perhaps freedom comes with a slightly different twist. We think that our products serve privacy in transportation in the future. They may not always be the fastest way from point A to point B in urban areas, but they should certainly be the most enjoyable environment you can be in when you're being transported. Or drive yourself, which still, of course, is an option. We think the car will become something like a third place. The first place being your home, the second place being the office, and the car then being the third place where you spend much of your time. What do you do there? Well, you do things like relaxing, working, communicating, some other things. So some of you may say, well, yeah, basically, that's what I'm doing today. But hopefully still a few of you are still feeling guilty when they're texting behind the wheel. Things that you're probably not wanting to do is to do a lot of steering, pedal work, or do things like finding a place to park. And this is why we feel for such an environment where products are used in, automation becomes important. Now, where do we want to automate? We certainly want to automate in products that we sell to our customers. And that's not just true for passenger cars, that's just as true for trucks. But we also want to automate for products that people share and rent, as in our car to go service. And the automation in these two areas is slightly different. In the first area, you need situational and gradual autonomy. If driving is not much fun, if you have better things to do than driving, or if you need a guardian angel to watch over you. And we have put out quite a few systems already, like Stop and Go Pilot, which is available today as an autonomous feature in our sedans. We'll extend on that and talk about this a little bit uh, later on. This, again, is not just true for passenger cars. This also is true for trucks, because in trucks there comes an additional element if the driver is free to do something else, and if that then does not necessarily count as steering time, all of a sudden, the economics turn out very favorably. So this improves the business of our customers, so we think. For the car-to-go vehicles, automation is still slightly different. The biggest obstacle for a car-to-go of not being used is that people look at their smartphone and see, oh well, the next car to go is just too far away, so I don't bother walking up to it. Wouldn't it be great if your car to go could just come to you? You get in, drive wherever you want, leave it where you want to leave it, not find some space to park because 
the vehicle then goes and parks itself. That's our vision in our product areas, and this is how we want to do automation. It's all about comfort in our products. You may ask, what about safety? Isn't automation also about safety? Well, it sure is. Safety and automation are a success story. We have brought down accident rates and fatalities tremendously. And in the last years, that is accountable due to active safety systems that automate situations where the driver would have caused an accident. But sometimes there's a slight misunderstanding being made when it comes to automation and safety. Many people say, well, okay, all the remaining errors, all the remaining accidents, they're due to human error. And then they say, well, to avoid human error, what we have to do is we have to take the human out of the loop. And then they conclude that only an automated vehicle is a safe vehicle. Sounds convincing? Actually is not. Because what we have automated in the past were the things that people do wrong. Yeah, so we have with a lot of success caught more and more situations where people as drivers did not perform right. What we are now doing is we are automating things that people do right. And we need to do that very well because otherwise those automated vehicles would create more accidents than we had in the first place. And this is, and I hope you agree, what makes this such a complex task that not everyone will be able to achieve. But that's what we're working on. Automated driving for us is all about managing the risks that are associated with it in order to deliver a superior product at the end. If you want to reduce risk, there are lots of formulas that you could use. Here's a very simple one. You have to look at how, what can happen. What's the exposure of certain things? Can you control those situations? And if something goes wrong, what's the severity? I'll give you some examples to add some more meat to this. Um, exposure, for example, means that you decide at which road class you want to implement an automated feature. How predictive is the traffic that you want to put it in, and under which environmental conditions do you want to automate? Controllability has to do with the automation level. Is it really fully autonomous? Well, in the car to go example that I just gave you, there is no driver, so you have to be fully autonomous. In other situations, you could share the workload between the driver and the machine. You could decide at which travel speeds you operate, and so on and so forth. And finally, as for reducing severity, you have to introduce fault tolerance into the system, and you have to come up with some emergency procedures. And to just give you one simple example of what this could lead up to, when we talk about road classes, for example, one of the next systems that you'll be seeing from us will automate highway driving. But perhaps not on all highways. Perhaps we start with more predictable scenarios in some countries. Perhaps we start at some speeds that cover most of the traffic situations, but not all of them, like 65 miles an hour or so, which is a good travel speed for North America. And when it comes to fault tolerance, we'll be adding dual braking and steering, and of course the suppliers of those systems now get a big grin on their faces because dual braking and steering means that you'll be selling us two brakes and two steering systems, more or less, for one car. But that's of course important for these kinds of systems. So if there is risk involved, and if we have to manage risk, how do we need to, to look at these autonomous vehicles? There's a good comparison that goes back to Clifford Nass, who was a professor at Stanford University, who worked in this area. And he said, do we need to be afraid of automated vehicles? And he said, certainly not. They are not wild dogs that scare us all the time. They're more like domesticated dogs they make us happy if we take good care of them. So that's what we're doing uh, in my team. And our mission is to breed better dogs. Our mission is to breed dogs that are good to have, dogs that fulfill a purpose, dogs that are well-trained, and realistically, dogs that are fully insured. And we've come up with quite a few of those dogs over the past years, 
um, preparing the systems that we are about to launch, like automated highway systems with nobody touching the steering wheel and the vehicle going perfectly down the German Autobahn. And we have, of course, transferred that to the truck that you saw out there, because uh, you can do the same sort of automation in a similar setup in other vehicle classes. And some of you may have heard that we've gone beyond the highway, taking these systems to routes within Germany, and as of late, have extended that to also take them to American highways and to American urban roads. That's where we stand today, and we're in the process of getting those systems ready for deployment in our production vehicles. So finally, some of you may ask yourselves, are these still dogs? Or is this something completely different? The honest answer is, we don't know yet. But whatever happens here, however big this becomes, we want to be prepared. Because we've been looking at this. Do these names sound familiar? Anybody? Know what these are? These are bold companies at their time, 19th century coach companies, all put out of business by the invention of Carl Benz and Gottlieb Daimler. Through our investment in automated driving, we want to make sure that this, what happened to them, will not happen to us. So are we paranoid? A bit. But Andrew Grove, former chairman of Intel, once said, only the paranoid survive. And you can be sure of one thing. We will not just survive we will thrive and excel. Thank you very much.